Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution, digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. Okay, welcome to this week's Climate and Coordination Orcast. Um, we have a variety of topics to discuss with you this week, and the first topic that um, I thought might be very interesting, um, sort of continues on our sort of discussion that we've been having for several weeks now about the preservation of human culture in the face of climate change. And I found a very interesting example of this from the Washington Post. And um, the Washington Post um, shared a piece, well, they, they published a piece called an English castle stood for centuries, climate change is prompting its collapse. And this is a very interesting piece. I felt that really connects um, the discussion we've been having about art and about civilization and about climate, which I think is a really interesting discussion and something that I think a lot of people haven't really thought that much about because we tend to think, I feel as human beings that certain landmarks or cultural heritage places are just going to last forever, especially if they've been around for the past few hundred years. But I think we really need to start discussing, you know, how to preserve these places if they need to be moved and what's going to happen. So I'm just going to read a little bit from this because I learned quite a bit. It says here in Key Haven, England, fearful of a French invasion after breaking with Rome, Henry VIII erected a line of massive coastal forts along the English Channel, and one of the most imposing is called Hurst Castle, H-U-R-S-T. It has stood on its sandy spit since 1544, although the Napoleonic Wars, through the Napoleonic Wars and World War II, its garrison protected the Allied forces on D-Day. So right there, you see that this sort of castle, this fortress, um, is a really important historical uh, landmark. Um, okay, all nations stand to lose cultural monuments to climate change, including the United States, but Britain is especially vulnerable. The country is stuffed to the attic with heritage properties. <laughs> I love that term, stuffed to the attic. Um, so basically, there's a new effort to really just try to preserve this place because it's built on a sandbar and rising sea level is a huge threat to it. And there's, aside from this effort to preserve this castle, there's also efforts to preserve other um, really important landmarks in Britain because apparently there's just a lot of them there. And, you know, just also because the history in the UK goes back so far, I mean, Westminster Abbey, I think, is a thousand years old. So you just have so much history there. And I'm sure there's a lot in France and other places too. But the fact that um, Britain is an island also, I think, um, really uh, contributes to this. It says to repair the collapse, which is the partial collapse that's already happening, and to keep the Tudor heart of the castle open, English Heritage, which is a group that's working on this, has imported 5,000 tons of Cornish granite and 6,000 tons of Pebble Beach to create a new sea defense, which costs more than $2 million. So obviously this is an extremely expensive um, project. And um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these sites that need to be protected. Um, and they talked a little bit about why this is happening now, because apparently the sea level rise has increased a lot lately 
Um, let me see if I can find just one more quote about that, and then I'm going to open it up to other people's um, comments here. But yeah, they are talking about how um, it's easier, you know, obviously to move a sculpture or to move, you know, a bathtub or something like that, rather than to move an entire, you know, building. And um, basically, um, we don't want to get into a, a place where we are losing touch with our history and I, I really worry about that because these places have you know real cultural significance historical significance and I think there's probably in the next decade or so going to be um, really a huge rush to try to figure out how to preserve these places because um, they are significant and they are under siege and nobody knows exactly how long they're going to um, last. Apparently the sea level of, in this century could rise as much as three feet. And they've already seen that with a couple of inches of sea level rise, certain par parts of this castle have started to collapse. So obviously we're talking about, you know, maybe 10 times more or something than has already happened. So anyway, um, I'm just going to read one last little piece here. It says the National Trust warned in March that while 5% of its 67,000 sites, natural and constructed, already face the highest level of threat from climate change, that portion could increase to 17% over the next 40 years, depending on what actions the world takes to limit future warming. So basically, you've got just a huge increase in the number of sites. And I love that they include both natural and constructed because I think they're trying to say that, you know, not everything is human made. Um, some things are naturally occurring, but they're also, you know, um, culturally significant. So I'll pause there. Just wanted to share that because I felt it was really uh, fascinating. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's just, I don't know. I can't, I can't help but just think about, you know, um, the other important things we need to do rather than save emblems or symbols of uh, mm -hmm. past war and wealth. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, I, I do, I do see that, you know, the concern about preserving history and stuff like that, but right now it's just like all hands on deck. It's like kind of low on the priority list in my opinion, but uh huh. Yeah, it's interesting you have that reaction. And, you know, when you say that, I, I tend to agree, obviously, securing our soil for future farming, it, it might be slightly more important than a, than a castle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but I agree. It's all important. And, and it's, it's good to care about, you know, all this stuff. Um, it's just like, yeah, if you if you were to assemble a priority list, I wouldn't I wouldn't put this one near the top. <laughs> yeah, I also think that, you know, for example, if we were about to lose some of the most important manuscripts of music of all time or, you know, recordings of all time, then I might, you know, think, take it a lot more seriously. But just because I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a historian, I'm not, you know, I don't think about this stuff as being that important. But if somebody said, you know, the manuscripts of Beethoven or whatever could be lost in a flood. And I, I would, pay, I would totally panic, you know, I would, I mean, hopefully like, you know, we save them, we scan them and save them or whatever, but like things like that, I, I do tend to get very emotional about that stuff because we, I feel that our culture now, because it's so digitized and moving so quickly and so forward focused is losing touch with its history. Um, you know, and I think that there's still so much more to be like learned and understood about history. And I just feel that we should save everything we can, even though we have much bigger problems. Like, you know, the fact that um, the ocean currents might be shutting off, you know, we have like other stuff to deal with that is more important. I agree. But I do feel that society these days is so fast paced that it could really cherish those things more in the future. I think there's a, a double edged sword here. I, I didn't know you were such an anarchist, Daryl. You know, you want to destroy the past and <laughs> start over. But uh, 
The, uh, no, that, that's not that's not my point. <laughs> I know. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I think preserving our culture and history is ultimately imp as important uh, in order for us to, you know, uh, learn from it and uh, 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 move past it, uh, whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, there's, you know, we have treasures that are, uh, we have and we don't want to squander them. We want to uh, maintain them. And yeah, maybe it's not an existential threat in the ordinary sense, but uh, I would consider it an existential threat because without that history, we would certainly move into a dystopian realm. Yeah, I, I would say if yeah. I continue on that thought, perhaps the most compelling thing one can do to preserve the memory of that castle would be to do a 3D scan of it or to create a compelling documentary about it so that it can be viewed by people ar around the world, um, you know, es essentially digitize the memory of it. If it's going to go away and you know it's going to go away, then, you know, um, create new cultural historical memes about the thing mm -hmm. yeah i agree but yeah i just i i really feel for the people who are cataloging all this stuff because they just said here mm. there's over sixty-seven thousand, you know places so it's like and that might not even be in the, around the world so it's like i really feel for these people um you know to take maybe a, a like a cornier example you know like if we were going to lose the mona lisa or something or the venus de milo or, or this sculpture of david you know i really understand why people feel that you know we might lose sort of a deeper sense of our creative i don't know progress or something i mean and i think you know that is something to be dealt with you know and I agree with you Daryl there are ways that we can try to preserve these things if they have to fall away but it just also just makes me sad even though it's not the most critical infrastructure it's not infrastructure at all but it does make me you know sad on some level mm -hmm. yeah for sure absolutely um but anyway oh yes I have to mention when I think about the loss of culture, I also think about the loss of our scientific culture. So imagine all the labs that are going to be impacted, and the very labs which might be working on solutions, and they're, they're simply not able to function because of the, either the temperature or the flooding or the storms or the lack of food. Imagine the loss of the internet and how, what that would do in terms of the slowdown of scientific uh, uh, development with respect to climate change itself. Right? Imagine the inability to um, fly to conferences and present papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. These are the kinds of things that I'm particularly worried about because, you know, I mean, it, it's a very, it's a quick downward spiral if we can't. Sure talk to each other at, at a rapid pace globally, we can't share results and we can't even conduct experiments, then then it's, you know, then this the as the situation gets worse, our ability to respond gets worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a new piece for the blog that I that I've been working on and talking about infrastructure is in there, internet infrastructure, because a lot of it is already becoming flooded very often I don't think it's been weatherized or waterproofed at all so that is a big um, issue and uh, yeah without the internet there goes your 3d holographic um, preservation of that building right <laughs> the internet is where we keep everything so yeah that needs to be protected I completely agree um, I do have another article I can share if there aren't any more comments about this one um oh great the next... uh, jim you're muted oh is, is jim saying something <laughs> sorry yes um you know this uh, uh makes me think of our discussion last week on nfts and reifying the assets 
that we have as NFTs uh, could possibly uh, uh, help to preserve them. Hmm. You know, this is uh, what Mark Miller talks about uh, in terms of uh, being able to, uh, he calls it e-rights, you know, property rights. It's not really property. It's the ability to control something and that everything, everything that you have control over or whatever is an asset that we've, that, uh, you know, what's the term he uses? We failed to uh, monetize. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, I'll share the uh, uh, link to the video on that. It's uh, very compelling, and it goes right to the basis of the concept of our chain and why, we, why we're using uh, uh, object capability, security model, and such. Mm. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, let's get to the next topic. Um, this is from Yahoo Finance, and um, this is another really important topic, something we've been discussing for several weeks, and um, I just found it very enlightening that this is, well, actually, I think this piece came from USA Today, but I read it in Yahoo Finance, so anyway, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but anyway... This piece is titled, When Turning on Faucets is a Source of Stress, Climate Change Shapes Where Americans Relocate. So this basically goes through a bunch of different stories with different families who have lived in different places and, and talks to them about where and why they relocated. And I find this to be a really interesting way to sort of explain this story, to talk to with different families that have different circumstances different ideas of, you know, what life should be like and just different, um, different uh, needs, you know, and I find this really interesting way to um, just learn about how different people pick their different places. So one of the families decided to move from Southern California to uh, Portland, uh, apparently for, because there was hope, the hope of, of more, um, more dependable water supply. And it says here that um, in Portland, apparently they've compost 67% of waste, um, which is something I didn't know, but that's great. And um, so basically they talk about, there's not really much data about like how many people have actually relocated because of climate related worries like fires, heat waves, droughts, and hurricanes. I would also probably add in their flooding um, but there are, you know, signs that says here that people do talk about this stuff when they're figuring out where to move. And this really shocked me. It said nearly half 49% of respondents of a survey, which was about 2000 people this year said they plan to move in the next year and they blame extreme temperatures and natural disasters for that. So if you're, serving 2000 people, you've got almost 1000 people who are saying they want to move and they feel the climate is to blame, which I felt was an extremely high number. And now the company Redfin is going to add in some climate related hazard data to the homes that it is listing on its website. And I find that really interesting and important right now, apparently only they show flood risk, but of course, as we know, there's lots of other types of climate risk. And so I think it's a really important step to just realize that people are worried about this and they're acting on it. Whoa, what was that statistic? How many of the people interviewed? So basically they surveyed, it says 2000 US residents between February and March. And it says nearly half, 49% of respondents say that they plan to move in the next year, blaming extreme temperatures and the increasing frequency or intensity of natural disasters. Wow. In the next so that's year. From the website Redfin, which is, I believe, um, a website that, um, that is where a lot of people search for homes for sale. Wow. So I think it's becoming an extremely important thing. So I just, I just really 
Um, and, it, and it also talks about the risk of climate disaster versus the price of the home and how some people are, you know, concerned about that. Um, it also talks about how um, the average temperature in San Antonio, Texas has risen by 3.5 degrees since the 1970s. There's a little graph here that shows that um, the days per year that are above 100 degrees has gotten to 25 more days. So basically it's over 100 degrees more often now than it was um, 50 years ago. And um, they also talk about different places in California and in the West that have the highest uh, wildfire risk. Um, and how people are still moving there, which is really interesting. It says the population of Placer County, California, which has the highest wildfire risk, 98 out of 100 in the country, grew by 7% in recent years, making it one of the fastest growing counties in the country. Similarly, Morgan County in Utah grew by 17.5% and has a wildfire risk of 95 out of 100. So I'm not sure what people are thinking um, moving there. Maybe there's some absolute reason that they have to be there. Maybe they're renting their homes. Maybe they have really good insurance. I don't know. But um, I thought this was a really interesting um, piece that just sort of talked about some of the risks that families have. And um, of course, the family that decided to move to Portland also is now dealing with the wildfires and um, they basically say, you know, you can leave where you live, you know, but you can't always necessarily just solve the problem by leaving because these problems are going to follow you almost anywhere you go. And, and we saw that with the horrible, horrible fires that are in Turkey, Bulgaria, Greece, they're all over California. They're all over Canada. Um, they're all over the world now. And so, um, you know, there aren't always other places that you can, you know, go. So I just wanted to share that if anyone has comments. And I know Daryl, you've been struggling with the fires lately too. Yeah, it's weird. Like um, similar story as far as um, the rabid growth in the city that I'm in now, um, despite the um, rabid growth of, um, of forest fires during the summer season seems like it's not a deterrent at this point i why do you think that is what do you think people are planning to do like have you talked with anybody in that area like what is do you have a plan like what what do you think is going on there yeah like i i waited out when we moved here two years ago um because uh, a big reason why i moved back to my hometown was because um um I couldn't stand the uh, the 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 uh, weather in Ontario, um, the brutal winters and the super humid, hot, oppressive summers, and the lack of uh, other seasons. <laughs> um, uh, so, and I knew I was kind of you know moving to a, a place where there were increasing forest fires, but I just weighed out all the pros and cons. A lot of people have been abandoning the big cities uh, mm. uh, as a result of COVID. Mm. Yeah, that's true. There's been a, I think there's just right now with climate, with COVID, with everything, with the, with the sort of re remote work revolution 2.0, there's so much flux happening. I feel that the world is really in a sort of, shuffling phase where things are really moving around and changing a lot and um yeah it's fascinating i do if anybody has more comments let me know but i do have just one last story i wanted to share and then i'm going to turn it over to jim who has some ideas to um present just after this so are there any other comments about that oh uh, no let's move on okay great so this is the final story I have for today. It's super long, um, so I'm not going to really read that much from it, but there just was a couple of terms I wanted to share, and I thought it might tie into Jim's presentation. This is from Vox, which is a um, publication that I love. They really make amazing video content and just do great reporting. 
And this is the piece is called Can We Save the Planet by Shrinking the Economy? And it's basically discusses, it's very long, but it's a super interesting and very informative piece that talks basically about the sort of um, the growth of this, uh, the, the, or I should say the expansion of this idea called degrowth, um, which is basically trying to figure out if there's a way for the economy to basically start shrinking so that we can address climate. And I really don't have an opinion on that. Um, I, I personally would be really concerned about the financial markets if that happened, because that's how people save for their future is that the economy continues to grow. So I'm not really, you know, an evangelist for this, but there were a couple terms and a couple of things in this piece that I thought were super fascinating that I wanted to share. Um, there's a term here that's called absolute decoupling, which basically means that emissions are shrinking while GDP is growing. And they've showed that while there are some people that think that basically this is not possible in the United States, or this is not possible around the world, there are 32 countries um, where this is starting to, let's see here, this is starting to happen, but it hasn't actually occurred. So like we're starting to see that, um, well, like for example, the absolute decoupling is when, you know, you have the GDP going absolutely up and the emissions going absolutely down. But I think we're starting to see in 32 countries where these things are not necessarily in tandem anymore. So that's why they're saying this is starting to happen. Um, apparently in the United States, the United Kingdom and Germany and other places, this is starting to happen, but people who are big proponents of the degrowth movement don't believe that that's actually possible. They just think that basically it's a, like a momentary, you know, decoupling or um, the emissions are going to happen in another place or, you know, whatever, things like that. But I'm really interested in this idea of absolute decoupling. And um, I'm curious to see if we'll be able to make it happen. Of course, there's still the question about, you know, the infinite growth on the finite planet, which is a big deal. And I don't think that most human beings have really thought about that, thought about the idea that, you know, we are relying on an economic system that requires infinite growth and also exponential growth every year. That is that, you know, in the year two, you have to grow more than you grew by in year one. Otherwise you're seen basically as a failure. Um, and, and then in year three, you have to grow by more than you grew in year two. So it's not even enough to keep growing. You have to grow by bigger and bigger margins each year, which is very, um, which is very difficult on this planet that is already so um, depleted, I guess. And, and in another story, also in the new blog I wrote, there's reports that say that 3% of nature is still intact on earth. So 3% is very little. And um, if we continue with this mindset, I'm just curious how we're going to be able to save our ability to thrive here. And um, so the article also discusses that, you know, the injection of wealth through capitalism around the world has, you know, done a lot to eradicate poverty and has raised living standards in the Western world, especially. And I completely agree with that. Um, but I do think it's really interesting to look at different ways that we could try to, you know, survive economically and survive um, biologically, obviously, because we need, I think most people would argue we need both, right? We need to be able to eat and have shelter and have clean water and be healthy. We also need some kind of an economic system. Um, also, this piece talks a little bit about GDP and why GDP um, does not always give us the exact um, st the story necessarily that we think it does when measuring GDP. So anyway, I just wanted to share a couple of those ideas. Um, if you're interested in um, these sort of economic reflections, this piece really goes into a lot of different um, a lot of different areas, including crypto, talks a little bit about crypto. Um, and it, I think it's a really, um, really, really great piece. It also mentions this book called Less is More, which is all about the degrowth movement. 
And I think even if we don't actually do economic degrowth, I think there's a lot that we can learn that can help us in the climate space. And I feel that I need to study it more before I really gain an opinion about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what I just wanted to share from that. And with that, I will turn it to Jim, who also has, I understand, some kind of a presentation for everyone. And we can have comments, too, about this piece. Yeah, I do have some comments. I don't know if others have comments. But um, uh, I'm sort of never been a fan of degrowth, although, you know, I see that this uh, system of consumerism and capitalism and uh, uh, wage slavery uh, uh, needs to die, <laughs> okay? And, uh, 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 and so degrowth applies to those areas and decoupling you know, is how we evolve capitalism into cooperativism, which leads into the next topic. Um, and uh, develop uh, disincentives of scale. Um, you know, like uh, taxation according to market share. Um, uh, so that uh, we have uh, more diversity than a few monolithic companies uh, evolve. <laughs> yeah, you're here. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get into thinking about when uh, Greg talks about the idea of sustainable versus regenerative and the idea that... Um, um, I don't know if I'd word it degrowth. I mean, growth is a very complex word. You could apply it to growing plants. Um, but um, uh, it's, we do need to um, readdress the paradigms that have brought us to where we are here at this point in time. And a big part of it is this idea of kind of exponential financial growth um so somehow we have to confront it um and we have to get to a place as a species where we live in harmony with the planet in a regenerative way where we understand that we aren't the controllers of it that we're part of we are participants in it um so how we get there is uh probably like Jim say, says, it's probably going to, well, it's definitely going to have to involve, um, uh, I don't know, I, I'm trying to avoid the word destruction, but <laughs> uh, uh, shifting away from the idea of, of modern day capitalism. Yeah, but yeah, we wanna uh, rebuild from the ground up our society into a new paradigm of uh, anti-rivalrous cooperation. But uh, we also have a lot of real problems to solve rather than the consumerist busy work that we're doing now creating garbage. And these is Present, all present a tremendous economic opportunity and we need to populate the galaxy and beyond. So, you know, I think we can uh, certainly grow and we should grow and it's our destiny to grow. I like the word grow. <laughs> yeah, well, as usual, these themes, these sort of meme level, you know, tiny phrase themes don't always have the best messaging yeah. um, many many times when there's a name or a phrase given to a movement or a cause a lot of people find that phrase not only necessarily offensive but also just usually kind of not very well not not very good at describing what's what's really going on and I love that you 
related it back to the plants, Daryl. And yeah, of course we want to, we don't want to degrowth the forests. We don't want to degrowth <laughs> the icebergs. We don't want to degrowth our souls. Um, so there's a lot to say for growth that I think is really positive. Um, but I do think that maybe yeah. degrowing de Jeff Bezos bank account probably would be a, a healthy thing for the planet. He'd probably even agree. Maybe. Yeah. In fact, I think his divorce might have started <laughs> that with a slight chunk, but um, yeah, I know I completely agree. And um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And it's just, it is actually really terrifying sometimes to think about it because I just think about the, just the raw materials and the resources needed to build, you know, for example, everybody wants, you know, transnational high-speed rail, a green high-speed rail as an alternative to flying. And obviously, you know, that would be great. I think we need to do it. It's over. It's long overdue. I just think about like what, like what the, the gargantuan amount of materials needed to do that. And I'm like, where are we going to source all these materials? Like, hopefully there's a lot that we can do in the way of recycling, you know, like hopefully there it's like recycled materials, but I just, you know, at some point it's like, even if it's for a good cause, it's like, where does all this stuff come from? And I, I really worry about that in the long term. but I, Jim, I want you to have time to present your thing. So maybe we should pivot to that. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to, uh, uh, play a couple of minutes of the video um, for you so that we have a, a basis for discussion here. Okay. Communalism or horizontal governance is the idea. Okay, communalism, there's a word that could get uh, uh, controversial. Hey, that almost sounds like communism. <laughs> Communalism. Yeah, here we go. Wait yeah, a minute. Democracy works best when citizens make decisions together on the local level in assemblies. They meet face to face with their neighbors and discuss issues of importance to their communities. They say okay, now we translate this to interest groups that are not geographically bound. I mean, government. It used to be that everything had to do with your geographical location, whereas now almost nothing has to do with your geographical location. Well, that's not true, but a good part of your life is dealing with things that are not geographical in nature, like this meeting we're having here. <laughs> Send recallable delegates to councils to make regional decisions, but power always resides at the local level rather than... Okay, in the co-op, we have committees rather than councils. With the nation state, people could reclaim and redefine politics as something we do for ourselves rather than just voting for someone and hoping for the best. Communalism also envisions a moral economy in which people make collective decisions about how to use natural resources for economic production with the ecological impact in mind quote by Debbie Bookchin. The disillusionment with both neoliberalism and state socialism is justified. The prevailing world systems in this view no longer offer us the hopeful prospect of resolving the vast social and ecological crises which now confront humanity. In fact, it's becoming increasingly clear that these systems, with their deep commitment to such values as industrialism, oil, militarism, centralism, urbanization, and spying on the public, have been instrumental in creating the social atomization and ecological imbalance which are at the core of these crises. War is a euphemism for psychopathic mass murder, ecological and societal destruction that our so-called governments do with impunity, and this must not be tolerated anymore. For this reason, what is necessary is an alternative vision of society, the future, and indeed reality itself, a vision which departs from the traditional ideologies on all these fundamental questions. As long as concentrated political or economic power remains, we can expect it to be used in the interest of those who control that power. If we look at history, it might not seem an exaggeration to say that there is some evidence in favor of this view. 
Society has grown too complex for one man at the top to be making all the major decisions. This is both a strategy for human liberation and a plan for avoiding global ecological catastrophe. If you look at the current structure of government for a large city, you'll find... Okay, I don't want to take too much time and may continue this. He gets into examples of, uh, uh, of how this communalism is actually being applied in various places around the world. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, that sounds fascinating. It's, it's like, basically, if I'm understanding it right, in a nutshell, um, it's basically disputing, was it Winston Churchill's statement, which is democracy is the worst way to run a country except for all the others <laughs> yes and you know here what he's doing all they're doing is decentralizing okay and uh, uh, the idea is every every uh, every uh, interest uh, group every work group every uh, uh, organization is uh, autonomous and has its own way of doing things it doesn't have to be democratic necessarily um, for uh, our gov, we're doing liquid democracy, for example. So, you know, we can elect our council or committee matters in a liquid democracy kind of a way. Um, uh, or we could do it in a sociocratic fashion. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but, you know, everything we do is going to be an experiment and we'll develop best practices for developing our collective being uh, and uh, collective intelligence. How would you compare liquid democracy with horizontal democracy? I, well, I mean, what they're talking about here, okay, you have councils. So that's not flat. It's not totally horizontal. Okay, the, uh, uh, so, uh, I think that liquid democracy is uh, certainly can be compatible with what you know the horizontal democracy they're talking about here, even though it's not flat. And it, well, <coughs> I guess liquid democracy is pretty flat in that everybody can anybody can choose anybody as a, a representative, and if they don't vote, their representative's vote or his vote, representative's vote counts for them. Um, uh, and, you know, as long as you're decentralized and have council, a level of councils and, you know, d the various stakeholder groups, which I think, you know, has to be much more than just uh, geographically based. Um, uh, uh, you, you know, you, ha you have a hier hierarchical system where the best solutions can can go to the go to the top. So people, people, you know, people, you know, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, find this those synergetic solutions that everybody can, can can consent to and truly have governance by consent. Uh, so, uh, you know, the in our gov we're. You know, we have bottom-up liquid democracy, and we're building top-down trust metric. So it's both bottom-up and top-down, and, and we think that's necessary in order to for an organization to have a unified direction and uh, and coherent activities, rather than you know following the whim of the today's whim of the majority. <laughs> And I think that's what Churchill was talking about. Today's whim of the, you know, my, it's just mob rule. And it's, you know, it, it's just uh, 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 disruptive and destructive and uh, ineffective. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, why we ha that's why we have a balanced power in, this, in the United States, you know, so that we to try to avoid <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. But that, that, um... Uh, was it RSA Animate, that, that YouTube video, um, pointed out that the, um, the two kind of binary forces uh, are not adequate to kind of 
to solve the problems required for right now. The kind of binary party thinking is just so low res. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Low res as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the media is paid to keep us fighting each other 50 50. <laughs> Yeah, so. And uh, there's just as much uh, disinformation on every side. So there was an article in uh, that I just read this morning that connects a little bit to what you're talking about, I think. And it was about Elon Musk and how um, he said in three sentences, the headline is, it took Elon Musk three sentences to teach the greatest lesson you will hear today. A simple solution to all your communication problems. <laughs> And here's what he wrote. And this is kind of like an internal memo to his staff, I believe. He wrote, communication should travel via the shortest path necessary to get the job done, not through the chain of command. Any manager who attempts to enforce chain of command communication will soon find themselves working elsewhere. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and the article gets into more detail about how decision making happens within an organization, and how, how um, you know, if you kind of give more responsibility to the people who are directly on the ground working um, to make more decisions, um, we'll have you'll have more of an agile, um, uh, 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 an agile organization that will kind of help uh, lead to better better and quicker decision making. If you have to keep following up the chain of command to kind of get a, you know answer for a simple thing, and then that person has to pass that on to another department that descends down that chain of command to finally get to the person who has to do the thing, it's not very helpful. In a strict self-management discipline, every decision gets delegated to one person to make the decision, which is an one way of handling it. The, uh, the, the opposite is when you have to go, go for a vote, of, a vote of, the, uh, of, of the whole membership for every little decision, which is totally uh, impractical and, uh, and such. And, you know, delegating decisions is uh, absolutely necessary for us to sca scale. Right, it's like they were saying in the video: one person can't make all the decisions. <laughs> yeah, it's the world's complicated for that. <laughs> right. That's probably a good note for us to end on. Uh, we have a staff meeting in less than a minute, so. Well, Thanks. thank you everyone for this great conversation. I'm sure we'll continue on this path more. Um, make sure you're subscribed to our chain on YouTube. Follow our chain on Twitter, and thank you all for a great conversation. Thanks, everybody. Indeed. Thanks, all. Ciao, ciao.